Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCready, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCready. So glad to continue the summer readings series. And this week, in these next few episodes, as you're listening in real time, will be from A.W. Tozer's book, The Pursuit of God. Take time with these. When, When you hear not only in the introduction and the preface, and you hear a little bit about his life, you know, in my uh, Producers Way School USA that's going on uh, right now, uh, their July assignment is to take hold of a biography of someone, whether it be Watchman Nee, A.W. Tozer, Elizabeth Elliot, if it's, um, you know, whoever it might be, but someone. I, I know one of the students is reading about Hudson Taylor, reading people who went before us and reading about their life. And it's just so encouraging because you realize this is not some new fad, right? This isn't uh, something so radical, right? This is this has been the norm of the lives of those that many times we stand in awe of them, but we never go any deeper to see what what is it that actually happened in their life. And so, in sharing. Uh, I believe it's chapters one and two over the course of these next episodes from Tozer's book, The Pursuit of God, you get a a deeper dive into um, what their life was like and what did God speak to them. And then they left those things for us to be able to read so that we can navigate with Holy Spirit through the days of our lives that we are in right now. So let these next episodes be of great encouragement to you as I read from A.W. Tozer's The Pursuit of God. Love you all. All right, my friends, continuing on right where we left off. In my book, it's page 43 out of chapter 3, Removing the Veil. Oh, what words, what words. So we continue reading. And I want to back up and read a little bit of the previous paragraph so that where I start today makes more sense. Hearts that are fit to break with love for the Godhead are those who have been in the presence and have looked with open eye upon the majesty of deity. Men of the breaking hearts had a quality about them not known to nor understood by common men. They habitually spoke with spiritual authority. They had been in the presence of God, and they reported what they saw there. Now here's today's reading. They were prophets, not scribes, for the scribe tells us what he has read, and the prophet tells what he has seen. The distinction is not an imaginary one. Between the scribe who has read and the prophet who has seen, there is a difference as wide as the sea. We are overrun today with orthodox scribes, but the prophets, where are they? The hard voice of the scribe sounds over evangelicalism, but the church waits for the tender voice of the saint who has penetrated the veil and has gazed with inward eye upon the wonder that is God. And yet... Thus to penetrate, to push insensitive living experience into the holy presence is a privilege open to every child of God. With the veil removed by the rending of Jesus' flesh, with nothing on God's side to prevent us from entering, why do we tarry without? Why do we consent to abide all our days just outside the holy of holies and never enter at all to look upon God. We hear the bridegroom say, Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Song of Solomon 2.14 We sense that the call is for us, but still we fail to draw near, and the years pass, and we grow old and tired in the outer courts of the tabernacle. What hinders us? The answer usually given, simply that we are cold, 
will not explain all the facts. There is something more serious than coldness of heart, something that may be back of that coldness and be the cause of its existence. What is it? What but the presence of a veil in our hearts, a veil not taken away as the first veil was, but which remains there still shutting out the light and hiding the face of God from us. It is the veil of our fleshly, fallen nature living on, unjudged within us, uncrucified and unrepudiated. It is the close-woven veil of the self-life, which we have never truly acknowledged, of which we have been secretly ashamed, and which for these reasons we have never brought to the judgment of the cross." It is not too mysterious, this opaque veil, nor is it hard to identify. We have but to look into our own hearts, and we shall see it there. Sewn and patched and repaired it may be, but there, nevertheless, an enemy to our lives, an effective block to our spiritual progress. This veil is not a beautiful thing, and it is not a thing about which we commonly care to talk. But I am addressing the thirsting souls who are determined to follow God. And I know they will not turn back because the way leads temporarily through the blackened hills. The urge of God within them will assure their continuing pursuit. They will face the facts, however unpleasant, and endure the cross for the joy set before them. So I am bold to name the threads out of which this inner veil is woven. It is woven of the fine threads of the self-life, the hyphenated sins of the human spirit. They are not something we do, they are something we are, and therein lies both their subtlety and their power. To be specific, the self-sins are self-righteousness, self-pity, self-confidence, self-sufficiency, self-admiration, self-love, and a host of others like them. They dwell too deep within us and are too much a part of our natures to come to our attention till the light of God is focused upon them. The grosser manifestations of these sins, egotism, exhibitionism, self-promotion, are strangely tolerated in Christian leaders, even in circles of impeccable orthodoxy. They are so much in evidence as actually for many people to become identified with the gospel. I trust it is not a cynical observation to say that they appear these days to be a requisite for popularity in some sections of the church visible. Promoting self under the guise of promoting Christ is currently so common as to excite little notice. One should suppose that proper instruction in the doctrines of man's depravity and the necessity for justification through the righteousness of Christ alone would deliver us from the power of the self-sins, but it does not work that way. Self can live unrebuked at the very altar. It can watch the bleeding victim capitalized victim, meaning Jesus. It can watch the bleeding victim die and not be in the least affected by what it sees. It can fight for the faith of the reformers and preach eloquently the creed of salvation by grace and gain strength by its efforts. To tell the truth, it seems actually to feed upon orthodoxy and is more at home in a Bible conference than in a tavern. Our very state of longing after God may afford it an excellent condition under which to thrive and grow. Self is the opaque veil that hides the face of God from us. It can be removed only in spiritual experience, never by mere instruction. We may as well try to instruct leprosy out of our system. There must be a work of God in destruction before we are free. We must invite the cross to do its deadly work within us. We must bring our self-sins to the cross for judgment. We must prepare ourselves for an ordeal of suffering in some measure like that through which our Savior passed when he suffered under Pontius Pilate. 
Let us remember that when we talk of the rending of the veil, we are speaking in a figure and the thought of it is poetical, almost pleasant. But in actuality, there is nothing pleasant about it. In human experience, that veil is made of living spiritual tissue. It is composed of the sentient, quivering stuff of which our whole beings consist, and to touch it is to touch us where we feel pain. To tear it away is to injure us, to hurt us, and make us bleed. To say otherwise is to make the cross no cross and death no death at all. It is never fun to die. To rip through the dear and tender stuff of which life is made of can never be anything but deeply painful. Yet... That is what the cross did to Jesus, and it is what the cross would do to every man to set him free. Let us beware of tinkering with our inner life, hoping ourselves to rend the veil. God must do everything for us. Our part is to yield and trust. We must confess, forsake, repudiate the self-life, and then reckon it crucified. But we must be careful to distinguish lazy acceptance from the real work of God. We must insist upon the work being done. We dare not rest content with a neat doctrine of self-crucifixion. That is to imitate Saul and spare the best of the sheep and the oxen. Insist that the work be done in very truth, and it will be done. The cross is rough and it is deadly, but it is effective. It does not keep its victim hanging there forever. There comes a moment when its work is finished and the suffering victim dies. After that is resurrection glory and power, and the pain is forgotten for joy that the veil is taken away, and we have entered in actual spiritual experience into the presence of the living God. And here is Tozer's prayer that he closes out the chapter with. Lord, how excellent are thy ways, and how devious and dark are the ways of man. Show us how to die, that we may rise again to newness of life. Rend the veil of our self-life from the top down, as thou didst rend the veil of the temple. We would draw near in full assurance of faith. We would dwell with thee in daily experience here on this earth so that we may be accustomed to the glory when we enter thy heaven to dwell with thee there. In Jesus' name, amen. Those were powerful words there from A.W. Tozer, and oh, how real and true they are. And as one who has come that way multiple times, I'm again pierced to say, Father, bring me deeper into the experiential presence that I know I'm already in. I know that I'm with you, but oh Father, do not let me remain in some type of um, contented state, but let me ever press forward to you, knowing that you will bring me in, that you will do whatever is necessary. And this is where truly, Father, we must say, though you slay me, I will trust you. Whatever your ways, whatever is necessary, I know that I can trust you. And my friends, as you have been listening to summer readings throughout uh, the books of Tozer and how we've read from Green Letters and we've read from, from Ultimate Intention and Life Together and all of these, I pray that as we close out this series, that you will think upon these words, these last words from Tozer out of chapter 3. And do not misunderstand them, my friends, simply because you refuse to go in further. Go with him. Stay with him. Let him bring you deeper into the experiential knowledge of him. For this is the place that we were meant to live. This is how we were meant to live. And let us not become content with wherever we have found ourselves and that we stop with our own satisfaction but we continue on that he might be satisfied for he wants you. I love that scripture, Song of Solomon 2. He says, for your face is beautiful, your voice is lovely, right? He wants face to face with you and with me. Let's let him have what he wants. What do you say? 
So I pray that this summer readings series, as we conclude it, after two full months, I pray that it's been a blessing to you. And I look forward to us launching out into our next episodes. Love you all. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at N 